YouTubers and subscribers, RoseRed17 here, and this is Fairy Tale 100 Year Quest Volume 7, Chapters 55 through 64. And I will say that these are the chapters where this arc finally ends. But before I get started, I would like to announce that this video is going to be the last review for 100 Year Quest, at least for a while. The reason? Well, for one thing, that there's more volumes in Eden Zero than Fairy Tale 100 Year Quest. And since I'm only reviewing these series in volume instead of chapters, I will wait until all the chapters are release until the manga book becomes a whole, therefore I can easily review them all at once. I know it seems like a lot, but that's how I roll with my reviews. So after this review video, I'm going to focus on Eden Zero for the time being until Volume 8 of Fairy Tale Hanjir Quest is fully released with all its chapters. And with further ado, let's get started. In Chapter 55, Fate of Death, it begins with Aldron giving a story how and why he put himself to sleep for centuries. As the state after the fight with Acnologia, Aldron stopped and rested to recover injuries. And to heal himself, the wood dragon god builds several towers on his body to nurture himself by stealing life energy from the people who choose to live there. And as the dragon absorbs the human life, it causes his body to grow. With so much energy he gained, it comes to a point where the power becomes uncontrollable. Therefore, Aldron created the five orbs to store parts of his magic power into each one of them. Now that the orbs are destroyed thanks to the white witch, the battle goes on between Natsu and the wood dragon god. But it seems Natsu is having trouble since he can't see the attacks coming. Meanwhile, while the other fairy tale members are fighting the god seeds, where we start with Wendy and Carla going up against Doom. Carla managed to take the first hit, but to her surprise, the god seed Doom has submerged her body in the pile of deadly spores, and only has a little time to live, and thus the chapter ends here. Now, with chapter 56, Reliable Friends, I'm going to go straight to the point and reveal the unexpected heroes in this chapter, and they are the secondary characters in the series. Max, with his sand ability, has a chance against the god seed, and apparently everyone else does in his group, but their magic powers are weaker than the god seed, so Wendy enchanted her own powers into them, and therefore each one of them had their own hits on the enemy, leaving Max with the final blow, and thus defeating the god seed and saving Carla. Now this was a surprise one to me, I didn't expect something like this in a long while, and it shows the reliabilities of these characters. And I will admit, it was pretty cool to see the secondary characters in action. It is nice to switch things up once in a while to make the show a little bit more interesting. Now before I start with the next chapter called The Power to Live, I have a few words to say. What the heck is this? Seriously, what am I looking at here? The official design of the Star Trek combination of Aquarius and Scorpio? Are you kidding me? It almost looks unpleasant to me. In fact, I've seen fan-made design of this outfit that look more official. And I know what you people are going to say. But Rose Red 17, it's not the appearance that matters, it's how powerful that Star Trek combination contains. Which is true, after all. It shows the strength of his magical powers as Lucy used it to take out one of the nearly unbeatable foes. In fact, it's so powerful that it drained the rest of her magic. But what I'm getting at about this outfit is that it's an eyesore. It doesn't look like it will match any other Star Jets designs of Aquarius and Scorpio. With the previous Star Jets combination, I could see both Leo and Virgo's Star Jets outfit merge into one, giving it a visual look for all to see. With this Star Jets combination, the two outfits seem to clash together. You have Lucy with robotic limbs and a swimsuit. How is that compatible for visual appearance? She looks more badass in both Scorpio and Aquarius' outfit alone than this clashing combo crap. I know I'm going to get some complaints about this topic, but I don't care. I'm just giving out my opinion on the matter. But enough said about this topic, let us continue with this chapter. The real focus of this chapter is Grey and Juvia going up against the God Seed Metro. And in the middle of their fight, Juvia is absorbed into Metro's body, using her as a moisturizer to increase his power. Grey is unable to fight back without harming Juvia. Metro takes this opportunity to thrash Grey to the ground. Now this one is one of those developed Grubia scenes that gains the attention it deserves, and the proof is here. When Metro asks Grey what Juvia meant to him, Grey replies, she's my power to live. Then we get Juvia's heart eye panel, and then suddenly her body starts to steam. Her body may be made out of water, but get it hot enough and it'll start to boil. And with Grey's quote-unquote love confession, Juvia's water has gotten all fired up to the next chapter called Ice and Water, where Grey tries to calm Juvia down when he suddenly gets an idea and plans to use Juvia's body to defeat Metro. And through these few panels, it cracks me up to see Juvia smiling while Grey is using her as a weapon not only to wound Metro, but also free her from his grasp. Grey and Juvia end the battle with the Unison Rain defeating Metro for good, weakening Andrei's power. Oh uh, yeah, did I remember mentioning that if they defeat a God Seed, the Wood Dragon loses some of his power? Just so I thought I'd bring that up, and I'll also bring up this moment where Grey acknowledges Juvia's safety, and we see him drawing himself closer to her. It's a nice little moment, but I must move on with the chapter as they search for the others. Speaking of the others, they're all gathered 
gathered together in one area, and then we see a familiar face with her love aparte and likes to say, what a pain. I am, of course, reverting to Brandish. She suggests it makes someone as big as Aladron to have an equal fight, but it can't be anyone considering their enemy is a dragon, so Gajio is their best choice. Meanwhile, it cuts to the end of the chapter with Jalal and the god sees gears, with Jalal's body surrounded by, well, gears. Now with chapter 59, Gears of Fate, I find it both good and bad as one of the good things is that I get to see Ols here again, but she's only there a brief moment to give Jalal a piece of advice. When Gear was manipulating Jalal's move with illusion, using his guild against him, that is when Oltir entered his time to give those advice. Therefore, Jalal uses thought projection to cast out Secret, who is the embodiment of all his sins and guilt, allowing him to defeat Gears with the Grand Chariot. Now as for the bad thing I have with this chapter is that it could have gone a different way than just having Oltir come and leave. And much as I love seeing her again, it just doesn't seem like the right moment. But I guess somebody had to give Jalal some guidance toward his redemption and live on for the one person he cares for the most. Not a good chapter, but not a bad one either. For what it is, I'm okay with it. And now for the next chapter. Chapter 60 is called Gigantify. Yeah, remember when Branch planned to make Gajio a giant? Well, here he is giving Aljon a good upper hook to the jaw. And while he's beating up the giant, not to inside dealing with the human version. While the others watching Gaggio and with Levy getting an extra expression on her face, Lucy advised Branch to make him bigger than Aldron, which Branch denied as her magic power has limits. She admits that she couldn't grow something or someone that large as they are also learned that Gaggio only has three minutes before the spell wears off. Therefore, the rest of the chapter shows Gaggio going up against the dragon form and at the end of the chapter shows the human force showing his anger. Chapter 61, Thickness of Arm, is the showing of Natu getting attacked by these spiky thorns as well as Gajio from the outside. And just when he got stabbed through the stomach, Branch's spell wears off, saving him in the nick of time. But then the horde of those spikes go flying overhead and come raining down, attacking everyone in sight, injuring those who come in contact. And Natsu isn't doing much better. His entire body is pulverized, showing that seems like a gruesome shadow. Yeah, any normal person would be dead, but you and I both know that Natsu Dragneel isn't normal. The proof is that the end of this chapter, that Natsu's raging fire has emerged burning all the spikes from his body. Chapter 62, Burning Will, showing Natsu unlocking the dragon force and maybe something more. The battle goes on between the two as Natsu has decided to kill Aldron instead of letting him live as he's considered a bad guy unlike Markphobia, the water dragon god. While this fight is going on, I have noticed the black flames revealing from Natsu's normal flames. It could be from the dragon forest, but it seems somewhat familiar to the flames of E and D. But I don't want to get ahead of myself and get to the interesting set of two Natsu flames, or should I say, the flames of Igneo, Igneo, and Atlas flames, the fires that Natsu absorbed from his previous fight, a mixture of the three fire dragons creating the Dragon Slayer's secret arts, Purgatory Dragon Fire. The wood dragon god is defeated, and what he said before disappearing is, with that power, he could burn the world, which is something that caught my attention, but it's probably nothing. Aldron's body has fallen apart, and the chapter ends with Natsu saying, only if the world makes an enemy of my guild, which is a death sentence to to those who stand in the way of harming his teammates, Natsu will show no mercy, but still a pretty cool panel. On to chapter 63, Dramil Banquet is supposedly the last chapter of the volume, but there is one more chapter I'd like to review before ending this video. Now that being said, this chapter shows the wizard guild Margaret Dragon showing the owner that the other one, the dragon gods, has been defeated. Next shows Igneo with that creepy expression of wanting Natsu to burn everything in his path, and then shows Selene who's going to be the next target for her team. And let's not forget these guys. Introducing a new member, Suzuki the Red Dragon, which I get the feeling that this will be a worthy opponent for the red hair swordswoman. As for the rest of the chapter, it's going to be a get together with funny moments, laughs, celebration, everyone's being their goofy selves, and then there's a moment with Urza and Jalal. And here I thought Grey and Julia's relationship was the one developing. But no, after all, I did see some moments with these two, but I just never mentioned it. After all, it is good to see the concept with their relationship starting to bloom after everything that's happened in their past lives. Jalal gives Urza a hug, telling her that he's free to love people. And this is where the chapter ends. Now, chapter 64 is called Auto Spring, which is sort of the filler, but also the introduction to the upcoming arc. It begins with a bath scene, of course, where the girls are spending their time in the hot spring, but then Brandish comes and thought it'd be fun to shrink Lucy as a thought of a more fun way to enjoy the hot spring, as the other asks her to shrink them as well, and then acts like it's a water park, but then when Lucy asked Brandish to change him back, she just disappeared. Now you see it as a filler, right? Throughout the chapters, the girls are running around the guild in their towels looking for Brandish, 
and then things get awkward. With Juvia ending up in Gray's mouth, Levi and Gajo having a conversation about telling the story to their kids, and then Natsu and Happy see small Lucy. Natsu gives that cute expression of pranking her, which I think is kind of adorable, so don't judge me. Now the three head out to find Branch, and then two seconds later they end up fighting her, and Lucy demand her to change her back. But then she realized her position before she could say anything. Branch changed Lucy back, giving us the Nalu butt face once again. Only this time, Lucy's ass is not in Natsu's face, but on the back of his head. And a better excuse than what happened last time. Seriously, I still can't figure out how the heck that happened. Anyway, the other girls are transformed back, having them feel uncomfortable. Got a panel where Gray is poking out Juvia, and I don't know what happened here, but somehow Jalal finds Urza in her birthday suit. Meanwhile, we get a scene with Lucy and Branch are competing in who will get Aquarius's key, and neither girls are gonna give up. And it's something I'm looking forward to, to see where Lucy will find Aquarius's key. Which reminds me... Hmm, nah, too easy. Now, at the end of the chapter, we have the White Witch waking up, and she mentions the name Elitz here, Swallowed by the Moon, thus ending this volume and ending this video. I don't have anything else to say, so I'll end it here. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit that notification button for new updates. Rose Red 17 out.